Mahi Baje Swakarma Kari Taste Say Rao Rave Pari Maje Translation The followers of the Fun Ashram Institution accept the regulative principles of the four social orders. Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Sudra, and the four spiritual orders, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas. However, if one carries out the regulative principles of these orders but does not render transcendental service to Krishna, he falls into a hellish condition of material life. Srila Prabhupada's purport. One may be a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya Sutra, or, or one may perfectly follow the spiritual principles of Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprasa, and Sannyasi. But ultimately, one falls down into a hellish condition unless one becomes a devotee. Without developing one's dormant Krishna consciousness, one cannot be factually elevated. The regulative principles of Vanashram, Dharma, in themselves are insufficient for attainment of the highest perfection. That is confirmed in the following two quotations from Srimad Bhagavatam 11, 5, 2, and 3. Go to the next verses. Mukti Bahu Padavya Purushasya Ramai Saha. Chatparo Jagjire Varanam Gurnai Vipradai Priya Pritak. Translation from the mouth of Brahma, the Brahminical order has come into existence. Similarly, from his arms the Shatri has come, from his waist the Vaishyas has come, and from his legs the Sudras have come. These four orders and their spiritual counterparts. Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprast, and Sadhyas combined to make human society complete. Next verse. Ye san purusham shakshad atma pavavam ishvaram nabhajantya vajanati stana prasta patyantyada if one simply maintains an official position in the four barters and ashrams, but does not worship the Supreme Lord Vishnu, he falls down from his puffed up position into a hellish condition. Okay, we'll stop there. Go back to the first of the three verses that we did, number 26. Umagyan to Miranda Syanjana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yanatas Mai Shri Guru Vedu Mahanama on Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasta Vitale Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Deva Gaurvani Pachari Nangiri Shisha Shunya Vari Pastyat Yade Satarine Panchakalpa to Rubis Chapi, Pasindu, the Ava Chapa Kitana, Bhavani Bio, Vaishnavi Bio, and Mahoma Maha. Jaisi Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadapar, Sivasati Gaur, Bhakta Vendu. So, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Um, there is an incident in the eighth chapter of Madhya Lila, wherein Lord Chaitanya travels to uh, Kabor and uh, he goes to Vishakapatnam, and on the banks of the Godavari River, he meets um, Ramananda Roy. Ramananda Roy is a governor, but he is uh, known as a sudra, although he has the position of a governor. And uh, ultimately, Ramananda Roy was coming on a palaquin carried by his, his assistants when he saw Lord Chaitanya, who was just as beautiful sannyas and just being in this particular place. 
he became overwhelmed. And then when they saw each other, their natural love awakened. Ramananda Roy is an, a manifestation or a reappearance of Vishaka, the gopi, that is very intimately related to Sri Srimati Radharani in the Vrindavan Leelas. And Lord Chaitanya is Krishna himself, but in the mood of Srimati Radharani. So on the complete pure spiritual platform, Vishaka and Radharani are coming together, the form of Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Roy. Um, they were, their love was so strong that they were embracing each other and holding each other so close for a long time that the carriers of uh, of Ramananda Roy were starting to wonder how is uh, how is this sannyasi? He's so affectionate towards this uh, to, to uh, this sudra Kayasta, who's and uh, so when Lord, Lord Chaitanya sort of became alerted to what they were thinking, he controlled himself. And later he said, "We will meet again." And so the next day they met in a more private way. And then there was a discussion, and at one point, the Lord wanted to know, using Ramananda Roy as his own voice to speak transcendental knowledge. So the Lord asked him, what is the perfection of devotional service? And Ramananda Roy began by quoting a verse Vanashramacharyata Purushe Padampara Vishnu Arnata Panta Nanduto Shanti Paramat. That the perfection of life is ultimately to engage oneself accordingly in the Vanashram system. Marche Sai said, Eo Bhaje. Uh, that's nice, but that's external. Give me something more. And then Lord Ramananda Roy said, he went into one verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Yat karosi yat nasi yat jahosi dadasi yat yat kapasi tukunti yat tat kurushar marapana. All that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away is whether all the sacrifices you perform should be done as an offering to me. The Lord said, Iyavajya, that's external. And then he, uh, Ramananda Roy quoted the next verse, which was Sarva Dharma Pradikshit Yam Mam Nekam Saranam Bajam Aham Tom Sarva Pape Vyo Moksha Yashyami Masi Chaha. Abandon all varieties of religion and, uh, and, and surrender unto me. Engage in my devotional service. I'll give you protection from all, from everything. Don't fear, don't hesitate, don't worry. Lord Chaitanya said, that's very nice, but that's external. And then Lord Chaitanya, finally he said, when Lord Ramananda Roy said, to engage in, one, in one's occupational uh, activity and at the same time hear and chant the glories of the Lord. He quoted one particular verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, Lord Chaitanya said, that's nice. So going back to the beginning, the first thing he said was Van Ashram and Lord Chaitanya said, Iyo Bhaji, that's external. Uh, and we see it here. That what, what is the position of the Van Ashram institution? It is to situate one in two aspects of one's life. It's a foundational principle that is necessary in order to make progress in the human form of life. And uh, what is that situation? To understand one's svakarma. Svakarma means one's nat natural inclination for activity based on one's psychophysical makeup, whether one is client to Brahma, Kshatriya, Vaishya, or Sudra. Now, in this age, Kalo Sudra Sambhavan, no one is born with the qualities of the three higher castes. Everyone is Sudra, 
but through education, then one develops or reveals one's nature, either Brahmana, Vaishya, or Sudra, or Kshatriya, or, or, or Vaishya. Yeah, these three. So training must be there to, to understand what is one's, uh, you know, Varna. But Varna is material, that's external. It's the way one works in this material world. And Krishna said, I've created this system. Krishna mentions that in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. I am the creator of this system. But to qualify where that system fits in, in the bigger picture of the goal of life, it's understood as a foundational statement and the other half of that found um, that that ashram, Varna and ashram is the ashram side to get situated in either brahmacharya, uh, grihasta, vanaprast, or sannyas. And today I was reading in Srimad Bhagavatam from the 10th canto that this is uh, fundamental in the human form of life, that one must accept one of the four ashrams and work accordingly. And Srila Prabhupada established that. But he did not establish so much the Varna aspect. What he emphasized in our Krishna consciousness is develop the qualities of a Brahmana. Because Brahmana qualities are foundational to the execution of devotional service, they're essential. But then again, Prabhupada didn't put emphasis in, on Kshatriya development and Vaishya development. But then as time went on, Prabhupada did more or less move in that direction and said, now we have to set up this Vanashram college and train devotees according to these three higher castes, Brahmana, Kshatri, and Vaishya. And the Brahmanas will be the teachers in order to engage the students accordingly and help to evaluate along with the, along with the, the spiritual masters, what is a particular person's Swadharma? Are they inclined to service in the Brahminical way, in the Kshatriya way, or in the Vaishya way? Sudras don't need training. The sudra simply means craftsmanship or uh, just assisting the other three higher castes. So at one point, Prabhupada switched saying that we do need Van Ashram, but we need Van Ashram in a spiritual way and not in this, because this verse says there that Van Ashram in itself is insufficient for attaining of the highest perfection. That's a very important part to understand. But it has a place within Krishna consciousness in that sense that it helps to establish one accordingly. And if one works according to their nature and serves the Lord accordingly, then one can make nice advancement and be very creative and very enthusiastic in their execution of their devotional service. But without devotional service, Ban ashram is material, and as it says here, that if one doesn't uh, come to transcendental service to Krishna, even if he's very expert at executing the Ban ashram system, because there are Ban ashramis, and there are follows of this principle of Ban ashram that simply by engaging and structuring society in Ban ashram, then you have perfection. But the scriptures speak otherwise that this perfection is not simply these these vana and ashram but what is it devotional service to krishna <laughs> of course when you speak of ashram you speak of something spiritual these are these are spirit the brahmacharya grihasta vana prasta sannyas but they can also be executed without devotional service. And therefore, there is this movement in the world to establish an ashram devoid of Krishna consciousness. And therefore, as this verse says, 
this is insufficient for an attaining for highest perfection. And what is the highest perfection? Uh, to go back home, back to Godhead by, by engaging in pure devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But here we find ourselves at a, at, a, at a junction in our Krishna conscious society, wherein um, devotees have not been really clear on how best to serve. And therefore they take up whatever service they want or they're engaged in whatever activities they're given. But Srila Prabhupada in 1974, although previously for the first, you might say, eight years of the, his movement, said, forget about Van Ashram, just Chen Hare Krishna. <laughs> That's all. But then Prabhupada switched and he made a, he made a, he made a, uh, a statement indicating his re emphasis on. Not Van Ashram, but developing Daivi Van Ashram, spiritual Van Ashram. Material Van Ashram is the society cannot be organized because it's too topsy turvy and too difficult to sort out. And people are all in Kali Yuga, everyone is, in, is born with no qualities. And the only qualities they have is according to how the society directs them. In other words, material qualities. So in 1974, you'll see Prabhupada's speeches in uh, Vrindavan. And in, in March, March 14, 1974, he gave a pretty extensive lecture for more than one hour, speaking to uh, Ridainanda Maharaj, mostly. And Ridainanda Maharaj is asking many questions regarding Van Ashram and our, our role within Van Ashram. And it's a very edifying discussion. And Prabhupada said, we must establish this daivi, and that's the word that's, that's, uh, that's fundamental or crucial, daivi, a spiritual Van Ashram. But here, it's speaking about Van Ashram in the material way. If one is born in a Brahmin family, then one is a Brahmana. If one, whatever family one's born in, then they are labeled accordingly. But now, it, two things are wrong about that. One, it requires training in order to come up to the standard. And the other thing is that in this age, everyone's born Sutra, below Sutra Sambhavan. This is the feature of Kali Yuga. Although one may be born in a Brahmin family, still they require training. Training has to be there. So Prabhupada wanted, decided to establish what is called Manashram College in order to elevate our society to a stage of Daivi Vanashram, working as a Brahmana, serving in a Brahminical way, but executing one's activities in devotional service. And that's, that's the cutting edge, as opposed to just Van Ashram itself. Uh, and we see that uh, uh, if you go to the next two verses, which somewhere are re related to this particular verse, you'll see the def defaults in the whole sy system. So here this, uh, yeah. These describe what is the, because it's actually confirming in, in a practical way, what is the Van Ashram system. It's created by Krishna, as Krishna says, I created the system. And we get the understanding that as a body has different parts, there's the head, the arms, the, the belly, and the legs, all are important parts of the body. So these four orders make up the social body of the society. And then the spiritual body are the brahmachari vihasta. That's the complete process 
But then again, it has to be in devotional service. <laughs> Next verse also is related to the first verse. And uh, Yeah, so keeping an official position in the four ashvaras and ashrams without worshiping the Supreme Vishnu, one falls down. And from it, and the word puffed up is, is, is used in this particular translation here. Um, the word brasta, look for the word brasta, being fallen. Yeah. This is a, a fallen situation like that. So it has purpose only when it's engaged in devotional service. And Prabhupada said we can establish this Daivivan Ashram by uh, extending our movement into the area of farm communities. He said there's where you can establish it. A division of labor a division within the spiritual ashrams helps to support. If everybody is working according to their nature and according to the rules and regulations of their designated ashram, then there is so much uh, progress. Just like when the four, when the head and the arms and the belly and the legs all are in good health, the body is generally healthy. And therefore, each of the parts of the body is supporting each of the other parts of the body. But if one part is not working good, then that puts pressure and makes it difficult for the rest of the body. And if the head is not working, then nothing works. So out of all of the particular orders, the Brahminical order or those who give uh, vision in the execution of Krishna consciousness, they are the most important part of that. But Krishna has to be the goal. Without Krishna being the goal, there, and as it says here, it's material, it leads to hell, cause one to fall down. So we are not interested, nor was Srila Prabhupada interested in material Vanashram, he was interested in spiritual Vanashram. And still, in 1976, in a room conversation with Hari Sari Prabhu and Satcharup Maharaj, February 14th, 1970, no, 1977, I'm sorry, in Mayapur, Prabhupada spoke again extensively on the importance of establishing spiritual one ashram. When Prabhupada left the planet, he was asked, do you have any regrets? Prabhupada said, yes, I do have one regret. Only 50% of my mission has been instituted. I've established the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, the distributed distribu distribution of transcendental literature, I have given, I've been open so many temples and we have, have, we have so many devotees who are coming up to the standards of being Brahminically qualified, but we have not established Daivivan Ashram. So he said 50% of my mission is still incomplete. I leave that to my followers to continue on to establish that. So this was what Prabhupada, and you can, um, if you go deeper into it, you'll see the importance of establishing transcendental manashram. A lot of times devotees come to our society and they're, they enter into the temple and um, they're given different services, but after some time they lose their enthusiasm, although they're chanting, although they're reading the books and attending the functions, because they're not properly engaged accordingly, uh, they somehow or other, after some time, gravitate outside and just wind up uh, either just visiting the temple or becoming a nice, uh, getting married and just, and just 
occasionally coming to the temple. So uh, we, we've had a difficult time instituting and establishing the ashrams within our society because we haven't really worked out the varnas in relationship to people's swadharma or natural and material inclinations. Of course, now this has to be, this is an important point. When one reaches uh, the a more advanced stage of Krishna consciousness, then one is inclined to do any service in any situation and be fully Krishna conscious. But that's not there for people who are just coming in. Generally, people have to be engaged according to their nature, and that will allow them to develop the creativity and the enthusiasm, and that requires education and training. So this is part of Prabhupada's un unfinished part of his mission. He wanted this daivya, and he said, establish these farm communities. This is where we can establish this spiritual manashram like that. He said, society will not last, the cities will crumble. He said, the cities will turn into hell and people will be leaving the cities. He said, we have to have these, you know, these farm communities to welcome people. And he says, not to engage them in spiritual activities, but to engage them according to their material tendency, the, their varnas. Well, so we'll engage them according to the, their natural inclination for work. And of course, we'll engage them in doing work for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He said, uh, we will be flooded by people running from the materialistic society as time goes on. He predicted that. And if you see everything Prabhupada said that was prophetic has so far come, come to pass. It's just a matter of time. So uh, as a society, um, and Prabhupada said, generally the farm communities are meant for the grihastas. The sannyasis can continue to travel and preach. The brahmacharis can also uh, live on the farms, but mostly they should also develop preaching in the different in cities establish a city temple and make devotees in the city temple and send them to the farms and engage them in uh, activities of devotional service there. So Prabhupada had a two point mission, small places in the cities and Vanashra, um, farm communities around the cities like that. Okay, so these are some, I went into the area of Prabhupada's mission, which I think needs to be re-emphasized over and over and over again, how that uh, these farm communities, simple living, more of a royal, rural type of life is actually the future, not only of our society, but the future of the world. And if we don't establish them when the cities do crumble, and they're already, they're already crumbling right now, <laughs> uh, how much more that will happen, we will have yet to see. But we shouldn't be waiting till the last minute before we actually have a program. Each and every everyone uh, should have a program that at one point, we may have to leave our present situation and go to a more natural environment in a Krishna conscious community in order to continue to live in this world. It's a little prophetic, but it's what Prabhupada said. He's been he said it over and over again. These cities are going to, he said, they'll turn into dens of thieves and it'll be impossible for honest people to live. <laughs> So, um, yeah, these are some things to think about.
it's not some scare program. <laughs> it's the fact that that uh, that we are so dependent on the material society for whatever we need for food, for water, for you know basic things that we need to live in, electricity, gas. Uh, whatever else, everything comes from one of some of the agencies that are present in the in society. If society crumbles, then we we will be lost. How do we? How will we continue? Therefore, Prabhupada said, "Grow your own food, make your own cloth, uh, plant herbs, and learn how to use herbs for medicines." He said, devotees should learn the science of herbology and learn how to make medicines so we don't have to go to doctors <laughs> and pay exorbitant prices and come back with a pill that may or may not work. And the last thing is, um, he said, yeah, build your own homes like that. Uh, if you take a look, you see that the Amish community in places like Pennsylvania, Indiana, Ohio, um, they're pretty much like that. I mean, they're pretty much separate from society. They are quite radical. They're also engaged in religious activities. They have a strong religious connection within their co communities. And their, their whole thing centers around uh, self-sufficiency. Like that. So um, we need to learn a little bit more in a general sense on uh, in Prabhupada's vision for the future. <laughs> so I'm just uh, throwing that out as, as a discussion period. So just see how devotees will uh, respond because we have different opinions of, throughout our society, how important this is, how, how much of an emergency it is, actually whether it's actually needed or not, well, you'll see. Generally for the sannyasis and the brahmacharis, it's not so much, but the majority of our society is grihastas and grihastas are not mobile people that they keep traveling from place to place. They have to establish themselves somewhere and so they can develop, make a living and at the same time raise a family. So that's the problem with that these farm communities are mostly for the grihastas. And about 90%, 85 to 90% of the Devotees in our ISKCON society are connected to the uh, Grihasta Ashram in one sense or another. The small uh, percentage are brahmacharis and sannyasis, very small. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. A little bit of current events. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Um, thank you for the class. Um, uh, is it okay if I summarize it? Um, I don't think there's a need to. Just go okay. right into the discussions. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so devotees, if you have any questions, comments, um, uh, realizations, please um, unmute yourself and ask. And it will be good if you could please keep your camera on while you're asking questions and during discussion. And um, if, if you can't talk, then you can uh, type in the chat box and I can, uh, I can read it out for you. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay. The hot topic. Anyone would dare to venture into a discussion or questions? 
Yes, so there is one question from the nursing Lila Mataji. Uh, okay. Let me read it. Let me read Guru Maharaj. So Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All Guru Shila Prabhupada. Dear Maharaj, what to do uh, when an, our inclination is mixed? So one doesn't know which Varna he belongs to. Can one ask the ritual master for help or there is different approach? Sometimes yeah. even astrology. Sorry, sure. Yeah, go ahead, continue. Yeah, sometimes even astrological help is not sufficient because nature is so mixed. Now, in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada writes in one particular purport that it's, uh, it's the duty of the spiritual master to observe their disciples and to uh, evaluate how best that they can serve according to their nature. So he already wrote that in the first candle, which was towards the beginning of the movement as a discussion point. So yeah, one should go to the spiritual master and Prabhupada's program for evaluation was the Van Ashram College. I think about Van Ashram College is that after establishing a a group of brahmanas who have many skills, those brahmanas will become teachers for the other uh, varnas. They will teach the, the, the Kshatriya Dharma. They will also teach Vaishya skills. Sudras don't require teaching. And they will also teach Brahminical services and skills also. So Prabhupada said the collective cadre of brahmanas will be the teachers in our society. But for a person who's initiated and has a spiritual master, they should approach their spiritual master to see how best they can serve. Um, the biggest criticism in our movement for years is that the temples need certain services to go on. And if certain people are available, then those persons are asked to serve in that way. And that may be good for the temples, at least temporarily, but it may not be the best for the individual in the long run. In other words, yes, the services should go on and people should surrender to the service. But then again, there has to be a checks and balances where one is observing how is this devotee making progress? And that's up to the spiritual master to see that. That's why in our Krishna consciousness, in order for things to become more uh, accountable, we have set up this uh, mentorship system where the devotees work connecting with their particular mentor and their mentor is more like a person who helps to engage them in the activities of devotional service and also to help them overcome their uh, difficulties, their struggles, their day-to-day -day, um, problems. So, um, it's up to the, the, the disciples to be eager to get the knowledge they need so they can make advancement in Krishna consciousness. Like I met one devotee and for years, he was training as to become a Brahma. Later on, he told me personally, he said, you know, I I, after some time I realized I'm, I'm not a Brahma. I don't have those qualities, nor will I be able to develop those qualities. But then he actually found himself resonating and really developing in the uh, varna of Kshatriya. So he started his own little group and was training. And of course, Kshatriya means organization, it means management, it means taking care of devotees, and it also means uh, protecting the society from outside dangers. So, uh, yeah, so when he started to 
act in that uh, that particular varna in devotional service, of course, he started to really feel happy and he resonated and he was able to, uh, you know, stay enthusiastic in devotional service. So there's been many discussions on the GVC level. And there's been many papers written by senior devotees on how to take care of devotees. And one of the ways of taking care of devotees is to educate devotees. That's the most important thing. Not only that education comes in philosophical teachings and scripture, but education in the practical sense on how to engage nicely in a particular type of service. If we don't have a particular type of service we can offer to Krishna, we're not going to really feel satisfied in devotional service. We can chant and we can read the books, but we should all be doing some service directly for the local temple, the local yatra, in some form or another. We have to serve, because without that service element, we don't grow. And when that service is connected to our nature, we grow nicely. And there's where the training program needs to be applied and, and developed. Hare Krishna Narasimh Leela Mataji, uh, does it answer your question? Yes, she says. Thank you very much. This helps a lot. Any other questions? Guru Maharaj, I would like to ask a question about the practicality of um, you know farm community, and um, uh, when you uh, you know you mentioned that uh, you know uh, grastas can um, um, stay in the farm community, and we can and I really like the point what you you mentioned that you know the devotees uh, can you know run the temple in the in the city, but then um, we can develop the community there and then take them to the to the farm community where they can you know stay and leave. That's um, Prabhupada's but, statement. Prabhupada said that. I'm, I'm just repeating it. <laughs> yes, it's a very, very, very nice. You know, it's it's a very nice feeling and idea that uh, if this implements and it works. But in the uh, practicality, like um, uh, most of the grastas, when they work, and uh, you know, the after the grastas, basically they work uh, until unless if they're living in the temple itself and supported by financially by the temple. But if they're working, then you leaving. Think, the you think you. Do you think this way of life is going to go on the way it's going on? It won't. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm personally, I support farm community. I just love it. But just practically, I'm, I'm thinking that how would it implement it? Like, you know, how, how we can move to, because Prabhupada said that he couldn't, you know, make it work. Like, he didn't have that time. So if we want got, to do it, how? He, he put all the ingredients. He gave us all the information. He, he tried. He inspired us to do it, and some devotees are doing it. We, it's being nicely done in a couple places in our movement where it's growing in that that area. Uh, for instance, in Hungary and in New Rajadam, and in, uh, in India, in uh, Bobardan Echo Village, and there's other places that are actually also developing. Um, I'm not sure about the Saranagrati project, but Gita Nagari is also trying to move in that direction. But yeah, we're slow in that area because um, it takes it takes a vision and it takes time to develop, and it takes it takes devotees who are surrendered to the ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, there's so many benefits. It's, it's more of a healthier lifestyle, 100% healthier. That's one of the benefits. Um, but uh, Prabhupada foresaw, foresaw the collapse of this whole modern civilization 
He said it will collapse. He said it many times. <laughs> because it's based on economic development and uh, sense gratification. Anything that's based on these material principles cannot stand the test of time. So there's more violence, there's more, there's more crime, there's more uh, problems. I mean, problem, these cities are just, just saturated with problems because it's not a natural lifestyle. There's nothing wrong with a city if it's God conscious, but it's not God conscious. Secular society will implode. You see, you see the, the fall of that many great empires in the past. The Roman Empire fell, the Carthaginian Empire fell, the Grecian Empire fell. All of these very powerful materialistic societies developed to a certain, and then and so the United, the, the American Empire is starting to fall apart now. And if America falls, the rest of the world will also feel the impact. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Good Maharaj, it helps. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's obvious. I mean, it's obvious. Go, go to a farm community for a little while and stay there and see what it's like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, and mo most of us are all city people and we like plugging in our, you know, we like to plug in whatever we need to plug in. <laughs> But it's not that you're deficient in living in such a lifestyle. You can also incorporate a lot of the modern amenities in these more simplified lifestyle. The most important thing is community. That's, here's, here's the foundation where you have a lot of devotees all working together for the same goal, both material and spiritual. And this is the foundation for the uh, Vedic society. Vedic society was a communal society. It wasn't simply this nuclear family where you have one husband, one wife, and a couple kids stuffed in, stuffed in an apartment and you're struggling all by yourself to do everything. <laughs> That's very true, actually, because in my back, back home as well, I've had always had like a very big family, all brothers, sisters, everyone will live together, like 10, 15 people in a family, they will all, uh, you know, stay together in one house. So it's, it's always working supportive. together. Yeah. Yes. You can, uh, you can, you can work four months a year on a farm and get everything you need for the whole year. Yes. Just for four months. So, yes. Here we go to work, we get a piece of paper and it says this is good legal tender. It's not backed by anything. And uh, if the government goes, the paper is just what it is, paper. Prabhupada <laughs> mm -hmm. well, gave it December 31st, 1973 morning walk conversation in Los Angeles, California with many of senior devotees. Prabhupada spoke about the whole futility of the, the, the paper currency system and how it has, no, you don't have any, if you have, if that's all you have, you have nothing, it's just paper. <laughs> Real wealth is land. Land is wealth. If you have land, you have wealth. If you have precious metals, you have wealth. If you have livestock, in one sense, you have some, I don't think what we call it, equity. Yeah, it's paper stuff, you know, it's, 
could go anytime. <laughs> like, and now you can't even spend it, even if you want to in some places. <laughs> So these, these, uh, the simple living, which is based on the Vanashram system as a foundation, is the way to practice Krishna consciousness in the future. But the future has become the present. It's not like this was like the future 20 years ago, but now it's the present. But the problem is, we're not all inclined to that type of lifestyle. So we, we kind of like get a little bewildered of what do I have to, you know, put on the overalls and big boots? Is that... <laughs> no, there's enough occupation for all types of people, even in these more simple type of uh, societies. It doesn't have to be completely, you know, agrarian. It can also be rural communities. The most important thing is devotees have to be together. That's the whole thing. In a more real way, instead of just, and the only time we're together is on the Zoom or through the, through the cell phone. It would definitely help because, you know, looking at the current environment, you know, global warming, use of the plastic and things like that, government even itself is pushing, you know, more natural ways of living and rather than using a car, using a two wheeler or, you know, using a bicycle in the city, uh, if you want to go to somewhere. So it's a, it's a really brilliant um, thing to, you know, if, if it's gone, you know, kick off something like this, a farm community, then I think the world will welcome it as well. Yeah, people people are actually doing it. Even the secular society is way ahead of us in these things. They're doing it. Many of them, but they don't have the foundation to keep it together, and that's that's Krishna conscious. The spirit, you have to have the spiritual uh, center. Otherwise, you don't have anything. You don't have anything really in common, except a certain lifestyle. And that'll change after some time. Krishna consciousness is that connecting feature that gives that lifestyle meaning. Otherwise, it's... Now you could say, yeah, you could be Krishna consciousness anywhere in any situation. But community is actually the foundation for uh, developing relationships and working together in the in together and in Krishna consciousness. It's a Krishna conscious society like that. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, and it's, Maharaj. it's necessary. What? And, for, and for children too. It's good, it's good, good environment for children. Still, you have your schools. Children go to schools and they have their schools there. You go, you send the kids to secular school, they come back and they, they learn all kinds of new language that, that doesn't work. <laughs> they, they come up, they learn how to speak very, uh, what is it, rudely to their parents. <laughs> they, yeah, so Prabhupada didn't want to send our children to secular schools. He wanted to develop these guru calls. Prabhupada's vision was a complete transformation of the entire society, not just to become another religious group and amalgamate into the society. That wasn't Prabhupada's program, nor is it going to work. It's a very big dream, Guru Maharaj. Hopefully, Scorn will you know live long, and uh, this moment uh, the devotees will you know make it work. Fingers crossed, yeah. <laughs> well, we're either going to be, we're either going to have to do it or we're going to be forced to do it. When you're forced to do it, then it becomes difficult. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think Shriji Mataji has a question. Shriji Mataji? Yes, go on. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my obeisances. Uh, thank you very much, Mar uh, Maharaj. This was uh, a food for a thought, you know, quite a lot to churn about, think about, uh, yeah, and discuss about. One major question recently I'm going through uh, in my service to mentorship, uh, two, two things I'm going through is, one is there are girls and boys, you know, at least at up to the age of 30, they are not decisive about even getting married. Uh, for boys, they are not sure whether, uh, they don't want to take the responsibility of Grihastha Ashram and neither they are joining Brahmachari Ashram. So how do we educate, you know, and the girls also up to the age of 27, 29, they don't think of a marriage. They, they are into making the career, becoming financially independent. And, you know, I, I find it very difficult yeah, to explain. It's, it's, the, it's demoniac society. <laughs> this is a society created by the demons. That's all. Uh, yeah, because everybody's disenfranchised from their roots, spiritual roots and cultural roots. And what is uh, the society just educates people to become uh, a function to push on the society. That's all. Jobs are based on what you can contribute to the society. And uh, yeah, people don't want to children grow up now, they don't take guidance from their parents so much. They get mm -hmm. influenced by the external external environment. Like that. I see, yeah, girls who are mar not married, sometimes they're even over 30 years old. I've seen some men, they're in their late 30s and their 40s and they're thinking, well, I'm not married now. If I get married now, it's gonna be a mess because I'll be so old, too old. So they don't get married at all. Yeah, we have a, therefore this, uh, this educate as I can come back, education has to be there in order to teach. What are the values of growing up in terms of what is your responsibility to yourself and to those who are related to you in either family members or friends. The society just educates people to become good economic entities and to enjoy your senses in different ways. The boys don't want to take responsibility because they want to, to use a, a word, they want to have fun as much as they can and enjoy. And the girls, they can't do that because there's more risk for the women to, to act in that same way. So they're very careful about getting married because they're not sure. And the parents don't take responsibility so much trying to get the girls married. They're also going along with that because if the children grow up and they get a good job and they're situated in, in, in that way, then they have some money. And people think, oh, if you have money, you're okay. Yeah. True. So, it is very difficult because they get well, married also late, then the whole ashram, the point, then some people would decide they don't want any children in their grahastha ashram. And then I go that, what is the point of getting married? Then, you know, if you, then it's uh, just, yeah. Prabhupada so, said when his sister was 11 years old. His mother was freaking out. She was <laughs> complaining to her husband. She's 11 and she's getting, she needs a husband. She's 11 years old, you know. So the psycho, psycho uh, emotional makeup of a woman is that the first person she falls in love with should be the person that she's going to get married to and not be exposed to all of these men all over. And then she gets confused and then she gets, becomes bewildered. She loses trust in relationships. 
and then she becomes less and less inclined to to get married. Yes, you are right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My mother the also. Culture, then... Yeah, the Vedic culture is like that. Girls are married before they're sixteen years old. Even before, even before they, they reach puberty. Prabhupada talks a lot about this. This is not a small subject. He really goes into this, explaining how when a girl connects with a man and at that age, she gives her whole life. And, and then there's no good question for divorce. She's trained that this is her husband. And then she learns from her mother how to serve. She learns from her mother-in-law, not her mother, her future mother-in-law, how to serve her future husband. Yeah. The Vedic culture is, is, is a culture that has very carefully coming from the spiritual and moral perspective of the psychophysical nature of the boys and the girls and how to, to unite them in a proper way. And not like, well, I like you and you like me, but then after two years, I don't like you anymore. <laughs> because it's not, you know, like, like words, I like you or I'm attracted to you. That may be there for a while, but after some time it wears off. So with the help of the parents, especially the father, and with astrological considerations as a support, then uh, it's important to get the children married, especially the girls, particularly the girls. Yeah. Nowadays, if a girl gets a good husband, it's a miracle. <laughs> it's, it's really That's another miracle. thing. Yeah. That's what I find because it is very difficult to find about the boy's qualities and the character. Sometimes parents, they don't know the character of a, their own child. Uh, it's, yeah. yeah. The society teaches, you know, enjoy as much as you can. But for the girls, that's a big risk. The boys, they do that and they think, well, I'm having fun, you know. Do we have uh... no, we, we, we live in a demoniac culture. The Vedic culture is lost. And we have to reestablish some of the principles. You can't go back to the pure Vedic culture because the environment doesn't allow for that. So we have to establish some of that. And therefore, right now, there's a lot of emphasis on, on education of young children, young young adults so they can help choose the direction in life based on based on moral and religious teachings and not simply about how I feel. The divorce rate in America, at least I know from America, is very high. At one percent at one at one time in, in the past it was 70 percent. 70 percent of people in America were divorced and some of them had two and three marriages. Now it's a little lower. You know why it's lower? Because people don't get married anymore. Mm -hmm. They just live together. Because it's easier to do that. You simply live together and you don't get into the formal bond of marriage. And then when it breaks up, there's no legal problems. You just go your own way. Yeah, I know very, I know some devotees. Oh, is that your husband? No, it's my partner. Oh, okay. <laughs> my partner. So that, they call it their partner now. No, it's not a husband or, or a wife anymore. Yes. So I make an agreement. Let's live together. And let's, let's give it a try and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, there's no loss. Yes. But society puts too much, put too much economic 
pressure on the newlyweds. I've seen that where you know, a very nice boy and girl gets married and the girl has to go to work that right at the beginning of her marriage in order to raise enough money along with her husband's work so they can establish some kind of uh, some kind of material situation so they can begin their their life together and sometimes it, that work doesn't end it just goes on and on and on yes true so yeah. yeah recently we were talking to one couple who has been married yeah. for six years and uh, we were just asking them that what about family planning and they were like okay financially we are still not stable to uh, have a child and we really had to go through like three four hours of a discussion session and finally they understood the importance of uh, family planning alongside financial stability because you can't just wait for financial stability uh, yeah people are Yes. No, it's it's the children that help keep the parents together. That's one of the important things that the children do by having a child that brings the the, the, the man and the woman together in that relationship. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we need more of education in youngsters. Uh, yeah. Because I had a girl who was who's 18 yeah. year old and last week she was talking to me and uh, she was telling me about her ideas about getting married and she said, I have to look for a boy and then at least associate with that boy for two to three years before I think of getting married. And I said, within that two, th two to three years, you will start disliking that boy because you would know so much about each other. So you would end up probably deciding that you don't want to get married. Yeah, yeah that kind of ideas and these girls have now at this age. That how can everybody. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The girls are confused. That's they're waiting and waiting and waiting, and the boys are just running around having fun, <laughs> so called. Yes. No. The girl has everything to lose. The boy doesn't have so much to lose. So that's the problem. That's nice. Yeah, we have like, like I, I, I work. I try to help sometimes my disciples and others find partners, and I refer to them to. We have some groups that uh, we call them the spiritual devotee matchmaking. Uh, Sanghas. And they always tell me these these groups that they can't really match anybody up. When they try to match them up, nobody wants to match up. <laughs> they have a hard time <laughs> connecting the boys with the girls. You know? Yes, everyone is looking for a perfect match. <laughs> well, the girl is looking for three things, the boy is looking for one thing. Should I tell you what the girl's looking for? Yes, please. She's looking for protection, affection, and um, some security. This is what the girl is uh, protection, affection, affection, and, and security. security. The boy is looking for the goddess of fortune to descend from the spiritual world into his <laughs> life. And sweep him <laughs> off his feet and take him back to the higher realms for unlimited enjoyment. <laughs> you are so very right, Maharaj, because recently I, I had one girl who is 28 and I was talking to one Prabhu without showing the photograph of a girl. And uh, that Prabhu is telling me, uh, Mataji, I am looking for a devotee girl who is, he spoke, he, he told me about one Indian actress, Ashwarya Rai. He said, devotee girl who looks like Ashwarya Rai. And I said, <laughs> Prabhuji. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it was you know i was just laughing with my husband i said oh my god this is like <laughs> i was i could not speak anything to him i could not tell him anything <laughs> i said okay prabhu ji we will look into it <laughs> yeah it's lakshmi devi herself has to come here <laughs> but guru maharaj for, for that particular person he has to be narayan to have lakshmi devi so <laughs> he can't expect right. to be when he is not narayan <laughs> there's not there's not too many narayans out there exactly <laughs> they don't want to be narayan and they want lakshmi devi that doesn't work does it yeah they say if they, they say if you want your wife to be sita you have to be ram <laughs> and yet usually you grab usually you have to d- develop relationships that are long lasting and that's that's the responsibilities that come with married life the children give that to help develop those responsibilities affection develops naturally in by practicing krishna consciousness we develop that affection but to get devotees to that stage requires much education because the society is 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 pushing in the in a different direction yes yeah it's 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 quite difficult so right now you see that one of the biggest occupations is marriage counseling it's really big so much either trying to patch up a marriage or trying to get people to the stage of getting married and i don't want to sound pessimistic because that's not been my intention but once you approach this whole thing in a very krishna conscious way with the help of senior persons who are your well wishers who can help you who can guide you but people don't want to take advice from them they want to do it themselves yes thank you um rajiv vilasini you look like you're really thinking hard there <laughs> Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> I'm also thinking because of I have two sons. It's like age about to get married, and they're still not ready to get married. So, <laughs> well, send them to India to find a nice girl. <laughs> I've been telling everything. If you want to go India, we can go India or here, but not yet, not yet. So. How old are they? My oldest one is 29 and my youngest one is 23. And they're still at home? They still at home. They're still staying with me. My god. <laughs> Throw them out of the house. That way they'll get married. <laughs> <laughs> You're still standing over here. <laughs> sometimes you have to put on the pressure and say all right you're on your own and that forces them to take responsibilities uh, well he's he's responsible kid he's responsible he's like he's responsible he's serious too but about the marriage he said not yet so okay i rest my case <laughs> yeah no he helps he helps us out for everything so he's responsible um um there's a my god sister her name is jagannath jagannath ishwari she's in um london she's a proud by disciple she's married to a devotee who is a disciple of prabhupad and she's written a book the four 
for activities of household life. I think that's the name of the book. Um, I did a study on that book. I mean, a very thorough study and I took notes and compiled those notes. And sometimes people ask me about them. If anybody wants that, those notes, The Four Goals of Family Life, yeah, that's right, by Jagannath Ishwari. I find that one of the best of all of the books within our society that is a guidebook for helping, uh, you know, young people move into that relationship and for those who are in that relationship to strengthen that relationship. So I could send that uh, text, which is my notes, but I, of course I would suggest you buy, get the book and read the book, it's really good. But if those who want the, the notes, I can send it to, uh, I'll send it to Satyabhama and then Satyabhama can uh, make it available to everyone who wants it. Yeah, it's about it's about a hundred pages of notes. So it's uh, I really studied that yeah. book because I gave a seminar on it in, in Croatia back in I forgot the year two thousand twelve or thirteen, something like that. Yeah, people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Yeah, the, these young people need to take guidance. If they don't take proper guidance, uh, the, the, uh, Raj, could you hold the book up again? <laughs> you, if you look at Raj's screen over there, you can see Raj there. The four goals of family life, there it is. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jagannath, Jagannath Ishwari, she's in London, so. Yeah. All right, so um, perhaps we can conclude here. So uh, tomorrow um, I'm doing initiations in the temple in the afternoon. I don't know how long that program will go on. Uh, you can connect to the program through, I guess, a Zoom link. Um, Srimati, Srimati uh, 